while you guys are, while you guys are making your way back to your seat, um, I just want to, uh, this has nothing to do with the sermon tonight. I just want to say something. It was probably, it was probably because of that amazing sermon that was preached last week on wives submitting to your husbands and, and, and uh, husbands loving your wives like Christ loved the church. But this morning, before 8 a.m., before 8 a.m., I'm in Chick-fil-A, because that's where my office is, and um, I dropped Josiah off at the ACT test, and I went in there way too early on a Saturday morning, and in walks none other than Carl Knox over here, ladies and gentlemen, okay, who was picking up breakfast for his lovely bride. He walked in, picked it up, and delivered it to her. And I said to her when she got here for bank price today, if I would have known that it was her bag there, I would have totally taken her hash browns out of it. Okay, uh, so there you go. Uh, love you. Uh, no, that's just awesome. Uh, so, okay, uh, fellas, we're nothing but boys in the presence of a man here. Okay, get your, get your acts together. Um, no, good stuff, good stuff. Thanks for being an awesome husband there, Mr. Carl. Hey, guys, I got another. Just want to get us going here on tonight's Ephesians chapter 6. I've got a Kind of a crazy question for you, but I really mean it as a serious question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why I say that in a second. But have you ever heard of the sport, a very Christmassy sport, uh, cage fighting? Anybody? Okay, all right. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, I, I've never really been into the sport. I guess not my jam, right? I mean, I, I like to play like golf, okay? Old man stuff. Like you don't get tackled in golf or hit. Usually, um, usually. So I, years and years ago, like when Jennifer and I first got married, I made a comment like in passing about something like, oh, it's like cage fighting, da 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 And she goes, wait, wait, what? Like, like her response was perfectly female. And by perfectly female, I mean like amazingly logical. She just goes, cage fighting? What, what is cage fighting? I go, well, you know, it's just when two, two fighters jump into a cage and fight. And she's like, that's a real thing? Like, in, in, in our world, that's like, that's a real thing. Like, people do, like, you're telling me that two dudes jump into a cage and duke it out. I'm like, well, yeah, un unless it's two women who are fighting. She's like, women can cage fight? I'm like, so there you go. Cage fighting, okay? All right, here, here, here's my next question for you. Have you ever heard of this guy right here, Fedor Emelianko? He, uh, he's Russian. And his, his nickname is The Last Emperor because he's an MMA guy, UFC guy. He's one of the guys who gets into a cage and fights. Again, very Christmassy sermon here tonight, okay? Um, and and so, so this guy, he stands six foot tall. He's 240 pounds of sheer savagery. They call him The Last Emperor because in a reign of nine and a half, ten years, just a decade of fighting, he went 31 and 1. And he did that not against people like me, he did that to other premier champions in the sport. So like he beat up the other kings of MMA and UFC fighting. Um, the 31 in one, he lost one time. Do you know why he lost one bout? It's because he used his elbows as weapons, and you can't do that. I mean, because the UFC, it has standards, you know, right? I mean, there's, there's rules, right? Um, so here's my question for you. We get jumping in here. Let's say that you have to step into the ring with that guy right there. Here's my question. What are you wearing? <laughs> A diaper. <laughs> what, are, what, are you, what are you wearing if you get into the ring with that guy right there? I don't know about you. I would want the Iron Man suit, Okay. All right, I'm just, I'm just, I thought about it. I'm like, I would like the Iron Man suit, but it's not real. So I'm like, I would like to wear a Sherman tank into the room, okay? Uh, that, that's about what I would think it would require for me to get into the ring with that guy and come out alive. Um, but here's where it gets really interesting. Is Paul, in this last few verses here of the book of Ephesians, he says this, I've got a better idea for you. I've got an excellent recommendation, and here's why it's so good. Because the enemy that you face makes this guy look like a cream puff washout of middle school wrestling. Those of you who've been with us for 10 weeks, do you remember how Ephesians started off? It started off with, you've been chosen by God, not based on your performance, but based on his love. And he's got this amazing inheritance for you. Guys, we're here tonight. That was like right there. Like one, one whole page, one whole page. And now, as Paul closes up, he's like, hey, listen, guys, um, check it out. There's an enemy coming after you, and he hates you, and he's so fearsome, so mighty, that God has given in his infinite wisdom out of his love for you the armor of himself 
to wear because that's what's needed. So I want you to pay attention to what Paul says about the enemy, and I want you to pay attention about what Paul says about our God. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 10. It'll be on the screen. Here's what God's Word says. <clears throat> Finally, this is, the, this is the last column of the, of the book here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the, of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, and so that you may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love in incorruptible. Um, it's funny to me how Paul winds this letter up, this that last little paragraph. He goes, hey, so I'm sending Tychicus to you guys, you know, our, our boy. He's, he's, my, he's my right-hand man here. And he's just going to tell you what I'm up to and how I'm doing. And so he can encourage you and everything and let you know what's going on over here with Paul Incorporated and Enterprises, you know. And, and just everything's good. Everything's fine. I'm just in chains. Don't worry about it. Everything's going great. The gospel's being proclaimed. And we're going to find out about how you're doing. And, and you're like, wait, wait, wait. Hey, Paul, that's awesome. Glad to hear you're doing well. Can we get back to this enemy thing here for a second? Hey, Paul, can we talk a little bit more about why we have to be wearing some armor here? And here's what I think the two things that just jump out to me, the black ink on the white page is this. Number one, you have a supernatural enemy. You have a supernatural enemy. This is what Paul's talking about here in these opening verses. Um, Paul says, uh, you know, he, I would say he's beyond our comprehension, and Paul gives him a couple different names here. He, goes, he calls him the evil one right there in verse, I think, 14, 15, 16, and he, he says that um, he, he, he calls out the ranks, the many, many ranks of, of, of helpers and, and minions that he has, you know, here, the... the um, the rulers against the authorities, against cosmic powers, the present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And then um, Paul just gives him that name that we know him by so well, the devil, right? They just call him out who he is. And so this, this enemy that we have, it's always difficult for me to talk about the devil without taking you back to John 10, 10, because I think it's just the, the best line on the division of life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it's one of those verses, like I always say, memorize it or get the tattoo. I don't care which, but you got to know this one because it's so important. God, Jesus says, there is a thief, and he comes only, he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. There are three things that he does, and he, he, he cannot do a fourth. The, the Bible, I, we were actually driving through Connecticut last year. I was listening to this with a friend of mine. We were listening to the, a sermon, and, and I'd never noticed that where I've always quoted that verse wrong. I always said, you know, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. No, 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 no. I, I was missing a word. The thief comes only to steal, to kill. That is it. He has a very slim playbook. That's all he can do. If it's blessing in your life, it is not the enemy. Do you understand that? Our enemy is Satan, and he leaves behind him a wake of brokenness. He leaves behind him a wake of death. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and he is very, very mighty. Again, just look at how Paul describes him in just this one column here, right? Again, take it to like, just, let's just have a little Sunday school moment for a second. Just run down the, the, the little stories that you know about Satan, about the devil, about the evil one, our enemy, okay? Starts back in the garden. Um, he, the serpent what comes in and he deceives the woman. She's not even named yet. She doesn't even have a name yet. Uh, it's Adam and the woman. She'll be called Eve. 
but deceives. And what happens? He leads them to rebel against God. And you know what happens? They are separated from God instantly. They didn't die physically in the moment, but they died spiritually in the moment. And then what happens hundreds of years later? They do die physically. So right now, Satan's 2-0. and just, just think about that, right? And then you go into, somebody said it in our feedback time, the, I think Carl and Greg, you guys mentioned it, the, 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 everybody's favorite Satan story, the one that just, just like, what? The story of Job. If you don't, if you've ever read the story, um, everybody just kind of reads chapters one and two and then chapters like 40. Uh, there's some good stuff in the middle there too, okay, guys? Um, but, but Job, devil shows up. And like, somebody said it, you guys go, have you considered my servant Job? Like, I... I'm okay with God never going, uh, Satan, have you considered my servant David? Uh, like, I'm okay. Just leave me out of the conversation, okay, Lord? Don't mention me. I'm, I'm, not, that, I'm not that guy. Um, but the story of Job, Satan shows up, and he takes all of Job's livestock. Every animal that Job possesses dies. He loses all of his children. He loses his, his health. He loses almost everything except for a really, really, really awesome and supportive wife. Um, you know, so, so he loses everything, and there's this great destruction that comes in the devil's activity, the wake of it, right? Um, it, you got another one here. In, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, the Bible says that Satan incited King David. I, I don't know what you might think that the, the scariest verse in the Bible is. This line is the scariest, the most terrifying to me is just a, a, a leader. David sins against the Lord. We don't know the exact nature. We don't know the exact nature of David's sin. It's just in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. But it angered God so greatly that, 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 that David followed Satan, that God sweeps through the land and, and kills 70,000 Jews, 70,000 Israelites, 70,000 who were right there because of David's sin. Jump, jump into the New Testament. Judas. Um, Judas follows Satan. And what happens? He betrays the Lord. Obviously, Jesus dies as a result of that. Judas, if you don't know, goes and hangs himself. Judas goes and kill, takes his life because he's so regretful, so shameful of that. You, you see that, um, again, Acts chapter 5, 4 and 5, uh, Satan fills the heart of a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And they lie to God. They lie to the leaders of the church. And what happens to them? They both drop dead right there at the feet of the apostles. Again, these are just stories here, but... I, Read through the book of Revelation. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen in the day to come about the, just, the, the mag, just the, the magnitude of the death and destruction that's going to be wielded by this enemy that we have. That's what I'm telling you. We say you have a supernatural enemy. He is far beyond your comprehension of evil. He's far beyond your comprehension of power. You see, our enemy is supernatural. You are quite natural. You have flesh and blood. The, the liability of your flesh is bones break, you know, skin tears. Cut us and we bleed. We have liabilities. We have frailties that our enemy does not. Now, you might be thinking, okay, okay, Pastor David, but like I read in First John, you know, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yes, that's true. It's awesome. I love that you love that verse. That's amazing. But it does not say that greater are you than he that's in the world. It's just greater is the one who lives within us than he that is in the world, okay? Which is, which is good, and that is sufficient. But it is not you. You have a supernatural enemy. And here's the thing. As I say this to you guys in a, you know, a climate-controlled night, and everybody's behaving themselves, and things are going well, it's just kind of like glassy-eyed, like, yeah, yeah, I heard those stories. Because if we're just honest with each other, we don't really care about these stories, about these rundown, like what happened to Job, what happened to David, what happened to Ananias, what happened to all of these people, until we find ourselves in the crosshairs, until we find ourselves under the gun of the enemy. Then all of a sudden it gets really important. Then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I need to pay attention. Wait a second, I need to turn to God. Um, love you? Are you not reading the black ink on the white page here? Paul is saying, this guy, this supernatural enemy is coming after you. Did you miss that? I mean, this is what we talked about in our feedback time. He is coming after us. This is why Paul wants us to be able to stand up and to withstand him. Paul's saying, you have a supernatural enemy, and that's why you need the armor of God. Now, I want you to take a look at how we've actually put this on the, the next slide here. Um, I actually did that on purpose because, again, 
I think a lot of folks, um, they, they, we, we're going to talk, talk about a, a, a piece of clothing, an apparatus of a, of a warrior, a, a, of a soldier, of a fighter, right? Um, and, and we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about, like, these various pieces and components of, 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 a, of a warrior's, you know, armor. But I think what Paul's pointing us to is, is how each of those phrases end. It's the truth. It's the righteousness. It's the salvation. And what I want you to see, guys, is that each of those pieces is actually talking about God. So it's not like the armor that just belongs to God. Like he's given you some armor. This is not the armor that belongs to God that you happen to fit into. No. I think what Paul is trying to drive home here is it's the armor that is God himself. Does that make sense? Does that fit a little bit better? I'm gonna, here's what we're gonna do. And if you'll get me my prop that I ask you to get for me, um, I don't know where it's at. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Job. Um, I, 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 wanna, I want you to see if this just resonates with you guys a little bit. Okay, here we go. I'm going to just burn us down these six or seven things right here be on the screen. The first one is this, the belt of truth. Okay, so um, here's the thing. Uh, it wraps around a soldier, right? It's everything, but it doesn't hold his pants up. No, this belt is a belt that he attaches his sword to. It's a belt that he puts his gloves in. It's a belt that he maybe hangs his canteen on or his wineskin. It's a, it's a utilitarian thing. It's not a fashion statement. It's a belt, the belt of truth. And, and here's the interesting thing is Christians like that, that soldier, he, we hang things, thank you, sir, we hang things on our, our belt, our belt of truth. We hang our lives, we hang reality on truth. And what does John 1.1 1, 1 say? Jesus said, uh, excuse me, um, we're gonna get John 1.1. 1, 1. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14.6. John 14.6, Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. Do you, do you understand how much more important this becomes when you realize and remember that Jesus called Satan the father of lies. Did you catch that? Jesus is saying, I am truth. Right there, John 14, 6. I am truth. And there is a father of deceit, a father of deception. But you can gird yourself, you can wrap yourself, you can ring yourself with my truth. Everything within that belt, the belt of me, will guard you and keep you and resist those things that just do oppose my truth. So, okay, let's just keep going here. The belt of truth, secondly, Paul says, take up the, where the, the breastplate of righteousness. Now this, again, is just a piece here that kind of covers the, the soldier's, you know, vital organs right here um, in, his, in his chest, right? Um, because here's the thing. You know, a soldier, any soldier could, could take a wound or a nick to the elbow or to a leg, right? I mean, it might stink, it might hurt, but you can't really afford much to happen and go wrong in this part of your body, the breastplate. This is what protects your vital organs, right? And so, in fact, our soldiers today wear a bulletproof breastplate, if you we don't call it that, but that's what it is. It protects the very important parts right here in the middle of their body. There's a fascinating line from the prophecy of Jeremiah. Again, I just want to point you to the fill-in-the-blank of the fill-in-the-blank. It's not the belt of Truth, it's, it's the belt of truth because it's Jesus. It's the breastplate of righteousness because, well, look at what Jeremiah says about who our righteousness is. In Jeremiah 23, God is, uh, I believe the word is bamblasting the leaders of Israel. I mean, Jeremiah is calling down some thunder here. Jeremiah is saying, Babylon is coming and you don't even so much as have your socks on. And your shepherds, your shepherds are asleep. Your shepherds are corrupt. Your shepherds are not doing their job. And he doesn't mean guys with crooks out with actual animals. He means crooks in the temple. He means the spiritual leaders of Jeremiah's day. They're all a bunch of charlatans. And then God tells Jeremiah to say this. I love it. In his days, whose days? The days of his son Jesus. See if this makes sense. In his days, the Messiah's days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Mm. You have a couple of options when it comes to righteousness. You have your own. We call that self-righteousness. You can walk through life, stumble your way all the way to a casket and think that you're good enough. Or 
you can trust in his righteousness because you realize that you are not enough. That's as simple as I can make it. There is the righteousness of Christ and there is everything else, typically self-righteousness. Paul would tell you in all the other letters he wrote that your works of righteousness, your good deeds will not protect you. They will literally not save you. You need the breastplate of God's righteousness. You need the breastplate of God. Does that make sense? Let's keep going here. The, the shoes of gospel peace. I don't know if you know this, but the Roman military was one of the first standing armies to like standardize um, shoe wear. Now, you and I would look at them and be like, yeah, it's just glorified sandals, right? But actually, they had these, these burrs on the bottom of these, these leather thong-like, you know, flip-flop things that kind of wrapped around their shins a little bit, um, and it gave them a secure footing. It gave them, <clears throat> it gave them like, a, when you're going to swing a sword, when you're running up a hill, when you're standing there fighting in the rain or in these slippery surfaces, it gave you a firm foundation from which to stand if you were a fighter. Look at what Paul says is our firm foundation. Look at what he says about how we gird our feet, how we stand. He says that this, it's gospel peace. It's the peace that brings us back to the Lord. Now, I know we're in December. We're supposed to be talking about Christmassy things and, and wonderful, like, you know, snowflake uh, uh, subjects and, and happy-go-lucky things, not about an enemy who's supernatural and we've got to put on this armor to like, stand up and save our, you know, have our lives saved. Um, but, but here's the thing. This gospel, this peace brings us back together with the Lord. And I love that line in, in, in Isaiah where it says, you know, Jesus is the wonderful counsel. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. And he's the Prince of Peace. Like, I love it. It almost sounds like he has come to bring peace, right? Like, he, he's the Prince of Peace. His peace passes all understanding. But there's a book in the Bible that actually says that Jesus, quote, unquote, is our peace. What is that book of the Bible? I just, I'm blanking. Oh, yeah, the one that we've been in for the past 10 weeks. Look at this. He himself is our peace. Like, you, you stop right there. That's good enough right there. He himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. I said, the devil deceives and divides. Look at what God does. Through his peace, ooh, he brings a holy God into fellowship and into communion with sinners like me. Whew, that's some footwear right there, okay? <laughs> like Nike needs to get on that, all right? I mean, that is some good stuff, right? Let's continue. Um, number four, the shield of faith. Um, we talk about, you know, the, the Roman military a little bit. Because obviously Paul is in a Roman jail. He's surra- I mean, he's le- not just surrounded by Roman soldiers. He's literally chained to one of them. Like I envision, like as he's writing the book that you and I know as Ephesians, like this hand's writing and this hand's over here like doing this because he's attached literally to that Roman soldier, okay? So he knows all about the Roman military. He knows about the legions. He knows about the cohorts. He knows about the centurions and all these guys, right? Because they're everywhere. And so what Paul's looking at is he's saying this, like, look at this, but th- this is our example. We know that the, from history that they had good weapons. We know that they had, for the most part, pretty good commanders. I don't know if you know this, but they had really amazing shields. They were big shields. They were shields that kind of like actually hooked together, okay? And there was this, this ball out in front called the boss, and like it would repel. It was just a way of allowing the Roman soldiers to unite themselves and just to march forward with this, this undeniable line of death. Is what, it, is what it was. And they used it in their swords, how they used their shields with their swords, their short swords, I'll show you about in a second. Um, but that's what they did. It was, it was a shield that allowed them, as Paul says here, to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. You probably know this if you've ever seen much movies or studied any kind of history. They, they, the archers of the day, I mean, it was the, the missile weapons they would take and dip them in pitch, set them on fire, and launch them into the ranks of the enemies. So the soldiers, these Roman soldiers, had these big shields, and they would defend it as the arrows rained down on them from out of the sky. They're on fire, and they would hit. And oftentimes, they would sink in so far that the fire would be put out because it sank into the wood. That was how they were designed. They would sink in and be put out. But, but sometimes, they didn't always go that way. Sometimes, The arrows come flying in, they're on fire, they hit, and they just keep burning. And now, like, you're holding this thing that's on fire. 
The temptation is to do what? Throw that thing down. It's on fire. But again, back to Greg's comment during our feedback time. Is that a wise move? Paul's talking about the shield of faith. Um, a few months ago, Eileen sent me an email about a question about deconstructing faith, right? We kind of went back and forth a little bit on that. That subject, I guess it's a real popular subject, like, well, I'm this enlightened Christian because I have I have deconstructed my faith and da-da-da-da, I've moved on. And like I, I can tell you, I can point to a long, long line of people who've deconstructed their faith who are no longer faithful people. They're no longer of the faith. And here's the listen to me, guys. There is an enemy and he hates you. He has come only to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. He will shoot arrows at you. And sometimes they will burn. Sometimes they don't flame out. Please, in those moments, reject the urge to throw down your shield of faith. It makes no sense. The devil has another arrow. Burn if it must, but do not abandon your shield. I don't care if you call it you know, the, the enemies are tax or, or some sort of newfangled intellectualism. Grab on to God and hold fast to him. Do not drop him in this fight. Do not let loose of him in this, in this battle. Look at what, okay, this guy who wrote this is Solomon. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. You know, I, I put that verse, I chose that verse, but I could have easily chosen, I think it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where, where, where the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it was, but it was Paul. And, and he says in chapter 12, verse 2, that he goes, God is the author and the finisher of our faith. I, 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 guys, I'm telling you, I believe with all of my being that, that, that Paul is encouraging us to grab onto God. He pushes us more here with the helmet of salvation. Um, now, in, in again, Roman days, that, that obviously was a, a matter of protection here. But I don't know if you know this, but, th- but their, 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 their helmets were often colored. They were painted to match all the troops beside them so that the commander, the general, could look out over the battlefield and be like, okay, there's the blue ranks, and there's the red ranks, and there's the, you know, the green ranks, whatever it may be. So he knew how many soldiers he had. He knew how the battle was going because he could see the plumes. He could see the, the, the colors of the centurion's helmets. They were color-coded. Obviously, the most important thing that these helmets did was protect the most vital part of a soldier's body, his head, right? This guy, David, he knew a thing or three about fighting. Listen to what he said in Psalm 62, verse 6. Talking about God, he says, He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. He doesn't just say that God delivers salvation. God talks about salvation. God outlines the way we have salvation. David, a guy who stared down a giant, a dude who stared down bears and lions and and tigers, oh my, he stared down more military fights and battles across 1st and 2nd Samuel than you and I can shake a stick at. He goes, I'm never leaving home without my helmet of salvation. I'm never leaving home without wrapping my mind in my Lord. Do you understand? Like I love 2nd Corinthians, we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. It doesn't, if, it's, if, it's, if that thought is not going to obey Christ, it doesn't get past the helmet. I love that line. Line is important to my life. So I'll, I'll tell you that. We, we, either, either the thought will be made captive to Christ or it will not enter. Paul knew, he knew about this helmet of salvation. Then lastly, Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit. And I'm borrowing Josiah's sword for this. Um, It it wasn't a lot like, uh, excuse me, it was not exactly like this sword right here. Um, The gladius, because what we we all see the movies about the Roman gladiators, they carried a gladius. And and it's actually a a slightly shorter sword than this, um, a a thicker sword than this. But again, short sword. This is not the Conan the Barbarian sword. It's just a a short sword. Didn't even have all of this intricacy stuff here. It was basically just a stabbing tool. Madison's getting really nervous up here on the front row, okay? Like, I got you, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you go sit over there by DJ. Um, so, so here's how. They would use their shields, right? And, and, and they had all these shields. There's just this wall of shields. And then they just kind of like poked. They just poked, step, poke. All right, what do we do next? Stepping and poking. There we go. They just kept stepping and poking until they took over the whole world. Well, here's the thing. Got a question for you. 
Is this utensil here, is this a, a weapon of, of attack or is it a weapon of defense? What did you say? It's an attack, right? What would you say? Yeah, you, you, you gig them with it, right? You stick them, you poke them, yeah, you kill them, right? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story and I'll let you decide. Years and years ago when Jennifer and I moved um, to Tampa, this was pre-Joe, uh, I had the, the distinct benefit of working with a crazy man. His name was Dean. And in Dean's office, his, uh, his uh, uh, we should probably share this sermon with him so he can let him know we talked about him behind his back. Um, Dean was probably 20 years older than me. I was like 24 or 5 at the time, young and dumb. Dude, walk. Dean had a suit of Batman's armor. He had a suit of real armor. He had a snake like falling through his you know, rafters and everything. I mean, all this, like, this huge, all this stuff. He was just a, he was a grown man who was a, a six-year-old child was trapped in a, in a man's body. And so he walks into my office one day and he goes, hey, Pastor David, have you ever like clanged swords together? I'm like, no, Dean, I can't say that I have. So he goes, you want to? And I'm like, are we insured for this? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I'm new. I'm recently married. I'm not a father yet, but like, um, I got to preach on Friday nights. Like, ah, come here. So he whips out two swords, massive swords, big, huge swords. And what had happened, because he gave, he was our children's pastor. So no children's pastor is complete without swords and lots and lots of swords. So he whips out these two massive swords, and they have these notched blades. He goes, oh, you know, so-and-so clanged them up. They, they were all beat up and everything. Still an a instrument of death and destruction. And he goes, hey, let's just come outside here. You hold this one. I'll take this one. I'll stand over there where Barbara is. You stand over here. And on the count of three, we'll run at each other and whack them as hard as we can. I'm like... I think, again, what is our insurance policy on this? And, and I'm looking, I'm going, like, there's a courtyard out by, my office was here, his office. Like, there's, I kid you not, there was the garbage can over there. I'm like, the big garbage can. I'm like, he's just going to throw my dead body into that garbage can when he's done. And he tells me, he goes, okay, let's just practice it. We're taking a couple steps and everything. Bang, and we're clanging it. And go, back up. Now, let's go five feet. Okay, now, bang, right? All right, so then he backs up and he goes, okay, listen to me, bro. He says, it's going to go down. On the go, you better swing as hard as you can because I'm going to be swinging as hard as I can. And if you don't come at me like this, we're going to pick you up in pieces. And he said, I'm going to be coming at you, so you come at me. Don't worry about it. And it's going to mess the place. It's going to notch up. It's going to be like, because we're, there's not like children doing this in the worship arts department. Now it's two grown men like going at it. And I go, okay. And I got really religious all of a sudden. Like, you know, I'm like doing everything. And so I get over the corner. And he's like, you ready? I'm like, no, not at all, but let's do it, you know. I'm like, I've shot guns. I've driven tractors. I've, you know, been on, let's do this thing. And so I grab this sword. It's massive coming out of the bar. Huge sword. I mean, it weighs like what, you know, Kelly weighs. I go, all right, let's go, let's do it. And we take four or five running steps, and we go, bang! And we just slam the swords into it. I ask you a question again. Oh, I have all ten fingers. I ask you a question again. Is this an attacking tool, or is it a tool of defense? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? But Paul says, Paul says that our sword is not actually a metal device. Our sword is one of the spirit. Our sword, he says, is what? The word. It's this. This doesn't look nearly as terrifying, does it? But can I tell you that a million of those cannot do what one of these can? Do you remember the story? Of course you do. It's the, the, the first story of the gospel. Jesus comes on the scene, he's baptized, and what happens? The Father leads him off into the wilderness. Who comes? Satan. And Satan tries him how many times? Tempts him. Three times. What does, does Jesus reach for? His sword? No, he reaches for the word. Who won that fight? I gave you six or seven stories at the beginning of this message. Every human lost the fight because they didn't turn to this. So what does Jesus say now in the famous passage of John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the most important part, the Word was God. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was, is God. 
Cling to the word. Trust the word. Swing the word. Grab hold tightly of Jesus. Okay? That's the armor of God. That is the armor of God himself. Maybe I put this up here. I, I don't know. Yeah, look at that. Jesus is truth. Jesus is righteousness. Jesus is peace. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is our salvation. He doesn't just bring salvation, guys. He is our literal, actual salvation. And of course, he is the word of God. So let's end here. Why does all this matter? Paul says, not once but twice, take up the full armor of God. You need all of it. You need all of him because you have an obligation. Paul's saying, I want to proclaim the word boldly. I want to tell people. I want the, the people in Ephesus to know who Jesus is. I want the people in Rome to know. I'm going to be talking to Nero on Thursday. Heard of him? Yeah, pray for me. I want him to bend his knee to Jesus. Listen to me, you Ephesians. You've got an obligation. Your business partners, your associates, your family members, your friends, your, 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 your cul-de-sac buddies, they need Jesus. And if you're going... Trust me on this, Paul saying, if you're going to go to them with Jesus, oh my gosh, the enemy is going to come swinging at you. So you better have on the full armor of our God himself. Ever since the moment that Paul, Saul, met Jesus on the road of Damascus, he entered into Damascus and began to teach, and he has not stopped all these years. And now he's in prison. I'm just, I'm just, church, root church, hear me. If I'll be done. Would you please, would you please suit up? Would you please talk about Jesus? And I don't mean like willy nilly, like apologetically with a whole bunch of disclaimer. No, talk about Jesus. Because he's the dividing line of life and death. He's the dividing line of eternity. He's the dividing line of love and faith and and God himself with a relationship with us. Would you talk about Jesus? And do so boldly. You're wrapped, come on, church. You're wrapped in salvation. You're wrapped in faith. You're wrapped in righteousness. You're wrapped in, what does the enemy have on that? Every time the enemy has come against Jesus, he has lost. And you are clothed in Christ. If you're here tonight and you are walking a new walk because of Jesus, celebrate that. That is just all, that's good, 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 good news. Somebody loved you enough to teach you about Jesus and teach you how to walk a new walk, a new life in Jesus. Would you do like the Apostle Paul? I'm not asking you to lead millions to Jesus. Lead one to Jesus. Let's just start there. Show somebody what you have been shown. Does that sound familiar, Iggy? Show somebody the one that you have met. Amen? Let me pray for you.